Welcome to All Grown Up Now, Tales of a Checkered Past. I'm Kenneth D. King, podcasting from my studio near Union Square in New York City. This podcast is an evolution of the tale, All Grown Up Now, A Friendship in Three Acts. This is season two, and it's called Tales of a Checkered Past. It's a collection of short stories from my salad days on up to the present. In each podcast, another self-contained story will be presented. These podcasts will be broadcast bi-weekly, so you get two a month. Enjoy. Another one of the strong women in my life was a gal named Pearl. She was one of my New York friends from early on, and this, episode 54, is a tribute to her. That was a bad day. Andrew and I had arrived back from spending the holidays with his family in Houston. There were messages on my voicemail, so I slogged through them. Then, as I was listening, came the one. You have one unheard message. First unheard message sent at 7.15 p.m. Hello, you don't know me, but my name is Kathy. I'm calling from a hospital in Florida. Do you know a woman named Pearl August? We need to get in touch with her family. If you could, call me. It's urgent. Oh, fuck. Panicked, I took down the number and I called. I can't give you any information other than that Ms. August is a patient in our hospital, she said. I need to talk to someone in her family. You just can't drop this on me, I exclaimed. It isn't fair. Really? I can't give any other information by law. Please, do you know how to contact her family? I knew Pearl had two sisters, one in Vancouver. The other was a photographer in London. It was a short Google search of London photographers to get a number. It was late there, probably one in the morning, but I called. It went to voicemail several times. I kept calling back, figuring that eventually someone would pick up. Finally, a man answered. Hello, my name is Ken King. Is this the number of Pearl August's sister? I asked. I need to speak to her if it is. It's really urgent. She got on the phone, and I had the unhappy task of telling her that she needed to call the woman in Florida. I also asked if she would allow the woman in Florida to talk to me as well. Then I called the woman back at the hospital to give her Pearl's sister's phone number. In a half hour, the woman from the hospital called me back. Her sister gave permission to let you know what's happening. Ms. August was in a motorcycle accident. She was the passenger on this motorcycle. They were T-boned by an old lady in a big car. And she wasn't wearing a helmet. They aren't required here in Florida. Oh, God, I said. I know, she said. Personal freedom and all that. How is she? I asked. She paused. There's always hope. But between you and me, not so much in this case. Oh, I said. It's bad. If she were wearing a helmet... She would have just had a broken leg. I sat silent. Then I was curious. How did you know to call me? My job is to reconstruct a life from the contents of a handbag, she said. Her cell phone was smashed, so that was no help. I found her business card with her website. I went to the website and read the testimonials. You seem to know her from what you wrote. I did a search, found your website, and called. I figured, as a self-employed person, you'd probably be checking your messages. You called within a couple of hours. Oh. Is there anything I can do? No, she said. 
it's just time now. As I said, there's always hope, but it's bad. Oh. I'm sorry about your friend, she said. I could tell from the testimonial just how much you liked her. Yeah. Well, thanks, I said. And please, keep me posted. I more than liked Pearl. I adored her. We met my first year in New York. I met her through a mutual friend named Dina, who I had met at a holiday party in the Olympic Tower in the previous December. Dina and I were both watching the lighting of the tree in Rockefeller Center below. We struck up a conversation, and that was that. Dina looked out for me that lonely first year when I was in New York, inviting me to all sorts of things. Her friend Pearl was hosting Easter dinner, so Dina invited me along. And that's how Pearl and I met. Pearl had moved to New York from Vancouver, where she had been a successful TV producer. A company in New York discovered her, brought her to Manhattan, and put her in charge of the Volvo for Life Awards, which they were producing. The principals in the company were a man named Fitz, and a woman whose name I don't remember, but I will refer to as that bitch. They put Pearl up in a swanky apartment in the financial district. Pearl liked those fancy buildings with doormen. They did cost money, which I assumed she was making. To describe Pearl herself, she had beautiful tan skin, dark eyes, and dark hair, which was straight, parted on the side, and cut below chin length. Pearl was taller than me, maybe 5'8", elegant, great style, and she had dimples that showed when she laughed, which was a lot because she had a great sense of humor. Along with the sense of humor, Pearl was generous, always taking people for dinner and treating. She liked good restaurants and good wine. She would never pour her own wine. She always said a lady always has her wine poured for her. And if a friend admired something while shopping, it would end up being delivered to them the next day. Pearl was born in South Africa, just where I can't remember. But it wasn't in a city. She talked about how wild animals would find their way into the family home. Her family moved to Vancouver after one too many times where one of the more dangerous animals got inside their house. Pearl quickly turned into one of my adopted sisters. We did the usual friendship things together. You know, dinners and movies, because she had connections through her job with the Tribeca Film Festival. We shopped. We explored the city. We talked on the phone as well, because Pearl enjoyed a good gossip. Early on, though, I had to lay down the law. Pearl was redlined from sewing. One day, when I was visiting her house... She brought a blouse out from her closet. She looked kind of sheepish. Uh, I tried to fix this, but, well... Her voice trailed off. I looked at the blouse. It was a white summer blouse with short puffed sleeves with narrow cuffs. The problem was, the cuff on the sleeve was designed for someone with toothpick arms. Pearl had cut through it and tried to sew it all back together by hand with Frankenstein stitches. What have you done? I said, alarmed. Well, I tried to fix it. Give me that, I demanded. You are redlined from sewing from anything ever again. Do you hear me? And I took the blouse away from her, and I repaired it. Whenever Pearl wanted to get my attention to my studio after that, she would just pick up a needle and a spool of thread and look at me. This is one of my fond memories of Pearl. One weekend, I had an out-of-town visitor who I will call Crazy Boston. Crazy Boston was an example of the saying, crazy in the head, crazy in the bed. Out of bed, he was clueless, and he could say things that would suck the air out of a room. As such, 
I never introduced him to my friends. He was unsuitable. He wasn't husband material. He was just damn good sex. So, this particular weekend, Crazy Boston and I spent fornicating in every imaginable position, stopping only to order takeout food and have an occasional nap. It was exhausting, but satisfying. Wow. He left Sunday evening, leaving me to survey the damage to my bedroom. The phone rang. It was Pearl. Hi, how was your weekend? She asked. I tried calling, but you didn't answer. Oh, yeah, I said. Crazy Boston was visiting. Oh, she said. And doll, oh my God, this bedroom looks like a herd of elephants stampeded through. Which it did. She laughed. Oh, so you were herding elephants? Yeah, I said. Herding elephants. That's it. From then on, if I was unavailable or I had a date, Pearl would ask, So, are you going to be herding elephants? The company Pearl worked for had only one client, Volvo. Pearl and I would discuss the company. She told me that she had repeatedly voiced her concerns that there was only one client. That worried me as much as it worried her. I told her of my early days in business when I only had the posh store in L.A. as my client. When they snapped their fingers, I had to jump. I realized early on that I was working for them, not being self-employed. The teaching came along and became another revenue stream, which enabled me to say no when I needed to. Over the years, I developed other streams so no one revenue stream had a stranglehold on me. I know, I know, she said. I've had this talk with them more than once. Fitz plays golf four days a week, and that bitch spends more time at lunch than at work. I've told him they both have to get out and prospect for more accounts. I've got this one covered. And by got this one covered, that meant that Pearl got to work generally by 7 in the morning and didn't leave the office until 8 p.m., Many were the days we'd talk on the phone while she was walking home from work. The first sign of trouble was when Pearl changed apartments. She complained that she couldn't afford the fancy place in the financial district. It seems that she was deficit spending to keep up. We went apartment hunting. I lobbied for something small and as inexpensive as one can find in New York. Many weekends were spent looking at one place or another. But they all looked grim and sad compared to the posh digs she was used to. Eventually, though, she settled on a studio apartment downtown in a new doorman building on West Street, a converted men's club built in the 1930s. It was less money, but sadly not by much. Pearl still put a brave face on things, but I was worried. It was 2007, and I was reading that the economy was starting to wobble. I pressed her to light a fire under those no-good bosses of hers to get some other clients. But they seemed to believe that Volvo would go on being their cash cow forever. While Pearl still wanted to go to good restaurants, to save money, I would insist that I wanted to go to that diner down the street or have a picnic in the park. Somehow, I had a bad feeling that she was still bleeding money. So whenever I could chip in, I did. Then, the economy melted down. I remember that time like I remember the stock market crash of 87. In 87... I listened to it on the radio, and I felt my stomach churn. There was no savings account then, so I kept up expenses on my credit card. Since then, I've tried to keep a little savings. 
2008 was tight for me, but this time I had a little money set aside. But Pearl had no savings. As I suspected, she was still, I later learned, deficit spending to keep up. Adding to this anxiety, Fitz and that bitch hadn't rounded up any new clients. You see, too many lunches and rounds of golf to attend to. It was just a matter of time. Volvo hung on to the awards program for another year or so, but eventually they pulled the plug. CNN took over the program and renamed it the CNN Heroes or something like that. The company Pearl worked for slowly imploded, and it looked like they were going to close. You built that. Why don't you contact CNN, I asked. Surely they know who you are and what you've done. Why should they reinvent the wheel when you've already built the format? Pearl looked at me strangely. What? I asked. Fitz never got my green card. What? Yeah. That was the one other thing he and the bitch had didn't take the time to do. Well, can he get it now? I asked. No. They just closed the company. No company. No green card. And that was the big blow. Fitz and that bitch blithely walked away, declaring bankruptcy and stiffing everyone in their wake, including Pearl. But what they did to Pearl was worse. She couldn't get another job without a green card. She was stranded. Trying to get a green card without a job is an almost impossible task. There are shyster lawyers who are more than willing to exploit people in this situation, stringing them along with the promise of success while bleeding them of their money. Which, sadly, is what happened here. Trying to stay afloat, Pearl used every contact she had to try to get work. When she was working on the Volvo for Life Awards, she developed a team of people to work with on different aspects of its creation. Her reputation was golden. She was funny, smart, knowledgeable, fair, and she paid on time. So she had developed enormous goodwill in the industry. But that wasn't a green card. Pearl could get pickup work, but it was erratic. To hold on to her apartment, she started subletting it and couch surfing. Why don't you let the apartment go, I asked. What about a roommate situation? If I let it go, with no green card and no employment, I won't get another. That's one of the realities of New York, she said. I'd be locked out. So many were the times I'd let her crash in my place. It wasn't fancy, a blow-up mattress and a rolling rack for her clothes, but it was what I could do. Florida. I remember saying, Florida, on the phone that day. Yeah, she said, I can rent a place cheap down here, and I can fly back to New York for my gigs. Doll, you could stay with me, I said. Why Florida? I just did a job here. I have a friend who will rent me a little place in the suburbs. It isn't New York, but I think that with what I can make by subletting my place and gigs... I can keep paying on my bill to this lawyer. Once I get the green card, I can move back. We kept in contact on the phone, and Pearl would stay with me whenever she had a gig in New York. She would also stay with Dina so as not to wear out her welcome in either place. She was staying at Dina's place the last time I saw her. It was Christmas time in New York. We met for tea that day in mid-December. Pearl was feeling optimistic. She had resolved that she needed to be here in New York to get the work. Even though she was trying to create the illusion that she was in New York, everyone knew. Doll, you can stay at my place as long as you need to get set up, I offered. This is going to be great. We'll get it figured out. Yeah, Pearl said. Dina also said I could stay in her office space in her apartment. 
It's all settled then, I said. She smiled. I need to get back home, she said. Next time I see you, you're going to be living in New York, I said. Yeah, she said enthusiastically. We hugged. Pearl let go of me, smiled, turned, and walked out of my life. It was not to be. Pearl spent her last days in intensive care. I kept in contact with Pearl's sister and brother-in-law during the end of December and into January. The first week of January, I needed to go to Connecticut to pull three tailored jackets out of my ass for a fitting DVD I was doing with Threads magazine. I would be there Wednesday through Friday. Then I would come back Monday to start filming. I got to the sewing studio at Threads, and we all started ramping up to pull the jackets out. Everyone else was there, pitching in. Judy, my editor and the crew. We all got cracking. And then my cell phone rang. It was Pearl's brother-in-law. We pulled the plug this morning. Oh, I said. I was stunned. Pearl never regained consciousness, he said. She had on her driver's license that she wanted to be an organ donor. She donated her corneas, her kidneys, her liver, and her heart. Of course, her heart, I thought. Her big, big heart. I started tearing up. Thank you for letting me know. I'm so sorry, I said, and I hung up. Not knowing what to do next, I sat on the floor. Judy brought a box of Kleenex over, sat it next to me, and tiptoed away. I sat there for a few minutes, then stood up. Everyone was looking at me. I need a few minutes, I said. Then I went to the men's room, had a good cry, washed my face, and returned. Everyone was still standing there looking at me. We need to get back to work, I said. And that's what we did. There was nothing else to be done. I'd have my grief later. If I were thinking clearly, I would have gotten a room in the hotel near the studio. But instead, I commuted from home every day. For the two hours it took each way, though, I wore my largest sunglasses and cried on the train. You know, the Jews have it right. When someone dies, cover the mirrors. As a Gentile, I don't quite know the reason for this. But in my case, it was that I looked terrible. I didn't shave. I wore schleppy clothes. And I didn't care. It was all I could do to get there and get those damn jackets done. The people at Threads were good enough not to point it out. I assured Judy that, come Monday, I'd pull it together for filming. Which I did. The fitting DVD gets good reviews, but to this day, I can't watch it. While we were producing it, I had the unhappy task of emptying out Pearl's apartment and planning the memorial. Watching the video, occasionally, I can glimpse it in my eyes. This was a bad time. Dina and I raised the money for the memorial, and she found the space to hold it. The first time we met to plan it, she was working at a place on the Bowery. My memory on that cloudy day was walking down the Bowery, wearing my large sunglasses and my new fur coat, crying my eyes out. Eventually, I got rid of the coat. That memory stuck to it like a bad odor, and I would smell it every time I wore it. The next meeting for the memorial was in that bitch's new office. After the company Pearl worked for crashed, 
That bitch had a soft landing starting up another company. This new company looked to be well-funded, judging by the vast offices overlooking Times Square. Looking around, I wondered, just why didn't she give Pearl a job? Why didn't she help? Sitting in that office, that fancy office that overlooked Times Square, planning Pearl's memorial, I burned with fury. That bitch could have at least found work for Pearl in New York. She could have helped her so Pearl wouldn't have to live in godforsaken fucking Florida and rent out her place in New York just to survive. If that bitch had helped out, Pearl could have been here instead of in fucking Florida riding on that motorcycle that day. That bitch made all the right noises about how sad she was. But... I felt it was her fault. I actually blamed her in my mind. And now here we were, planning Pearl's memorial with that bitch acting like Lady Bountiful for letting us use her office. Afterwards, Dina and I left the building and were engulfed in the Saturday evening crowd on Times Square. It was after dark, cold, and windy. Dina stopped, turned, and looked at me. She started to cry. I hugged her and started to cry. And we both cried. There we stood, buffeted by the cold wind and the anonymous crowd in Times Square, crying for what seemed like forever, mourning our friend Pearl. The memorial was in a vast loft space on Lower Broadway. Dina's boyfriend Howard was a photographer and rented this space for his work, as well as renting it out for events. We all brought food, flowers, some drapery to soften the place up. We adjusted the lighting and set up the chairs and the altar. Pearl's sister Adele from Vancouver arrived. You could see the family resemblance, the charm, the dark hair, the tan skin. But where Adele was the jolly one, Pearl was the elegant one. I introduced myself and said how much I regretted meeting her under these circumstances, as Pearl adored Estelle. Adele brought Pearl's ashes in a mother-of-pearl box, which we sat on the improvised altar in front of a bouquet of flowers and her photo. Soon, a crowd gathered. Word had got out, and everyone in New York whose life Pearl had touched was there. For the most part, The memorial is a blur to me. I spent a lot of time trying not to successfully not to cry. The music I chose for the memorial was an aria, Chi Bel Sonia di Doretta, from the opera La Rondine, sung by Leontine Price. When Pearl stayed with me, we would listen to Lee and Teen Price, and this was her favorite. As it played, I buried my face in my handkerchief and silently wept. Then it was my turn to speak. I met Pearl when she invited me to Easter dinner. Little did I know when I accepted the invitation that I was meeting someone who would become like a sister to me. Pearl and I would listen to opera when she would stay with me. I chose this particular opera, Chi Bel Sonia di Doretta, from the opera La Rondine, sung by Leontine Price, because Pearl loved it so. When preparing to speak, I looked up what the aria was about. In the opera... Doretta sings about the sparrows returning north from the south. I think about Pearl living in the south, planning to return to the north, but it was not to be. 
she was named Pearl. But as a jewel, she was more like a diamond. Beautiful, multifaceted, brilliant. She brought light, sparkle, and brilliance to all around her, and I, for one, will miss her terribly. The memorial ended, and people hung around, ate, drank, and reminisced about Pearl. She was well-loved by many. After the memorial... I got to talk to Adele while packing everything up. She told me that Pearl was profoundly in debt, without any prospects for digging out. She felt that in some weird way, the accident was Pearl's way out. Looking back at that time, I ponder what happened, especially after the economy crashed in 2008. I compared it to the different fates of Pearl and Fitz and that bitch. Pearl ended up financially ruined. In my mind, she, as well as many others, were casualties of that crash. In contrast, Fitz and that bitch dismissed their debts and landed on other opportunities. Just like the bankers who went scot-free and got to keep their ill-gotten gains while many thousands of people lost their homes, their jobs, and their retirements. It just seems like there's no justice. After the memorial, Pearl's sisters decided that her ashes would be scattered, some in Vancouver, where her mother lived, some in Florida, where she had found another circle of friends, and the remainder in the New York Harbor. We all decided on an evening the following May. It was cool that evening, and it rained earlier in the afternoon. A group of people met Adele in the lobby of Pearl's old building on West Street, and we all walked over to Battery Park down by the water. The sun was giving us a golden sunset after the rain, and there were still big, puffy clouds in the sky. We all stood in a circle. People shared reminiscences of Pearl. Someone read some poetry. Another burned incense. Then everyone fell quiet. The time had come. Adele had Pearl's ashes. They were still in the Mother of Pearl box. Adele walked over to the rail, opened the box, and emptied the ashes into the water. She threw the box in afterwards. Dina had brought a bouquet of flowers. She walked over and threw the flowers into the water. We all stood silent. There we stood for what seemed like hours, watching the bouquet drift off into the harbor. Then, right before the flowers disappeared from sight, an enormous bolt of lightning shot out of the clouds right onto the bouquet, and it was gone like Pearl. Pearl is gone, but she's not forgotten, not by me, and I'm sure there are many others. Thanks for listening. You can get the audiobook All Grown Up Now on iTunes, Audible, and Amazon, or from my website, allgrownupnow.com. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you have any questions, you can reach me through the website, allgrownupnow.com. 
You can follow me on Instagram at Kenneth D. King, on Facebook at Kenneth D. King Design, or on my main website, KennethDKing.com.